Welcome, I'm Salvatore Di Girolamo, a PhD student at ETH Zurich, and today I will present PSPIN, a risk 5 network accelerator for flexible, high-performance, low-power packet processing. So if we look at today workloads, we see that they span from uh, video streaming services to online collaboration tools, which have become extremely popular during this pandemic, to high-frequency trading, and they normally run on uh, large-scale data centers. On the HPC side, we find uh, climate sciences uh, simulations and uh, large-scale uh, large cosmological simulations that are just a few examples of uh, workloads that run on HPC systems. Now, one thing that these workloads have in common is the fact that they produce an enormous amount of data that needs to be exchanged fast, either because of quality of service constraints or to make simulations more efficient. As a consequence, one critical component of these systems is the interconnection network, for which we can uh, synthesize the requirements as low latency and high throughput. A key technology to satisfy those requirements is RTMA, Remote Direct Memory Access. In this slide, we have a small recap of how RTMA works. Here we have a compute node with an RTMA NIC, the host memory and the CPU complex. As we receive data from the network, the RDMA NIC processes it and copies directly to the host memory into the application specified buffers. Now, this is the nice thing about RDMA. So we get to bypass the operating system on the critical path and we get the data exactly where we want it to be. However, RDMA stops here. Now, if you want to uh, process this data, you need to get it through the whole memory hierarchy up to the CPU registers where you can finally access it. The question is, is this system ideal for packet processing or better for tasks that can be expressed on a streaming fashion on a per packet basis? And this becomes kind of a concern if we look at today packet rates, so one packet every five nanoseconds with a, a ConnectX5. If we look at 400G, that's going to be one packet every 1.2 nanoseconds. So, the concern is not only about the latencies that we are going to experience, but also about the throughput, because now getting the data through the memory hierarchy is, go is going to mean um, cache pollution, and also we could experience worse noise that can impact the throughput. So the observation is uh, that on this same system, we already have a unit that is uh, built for processing packets at these rates, and this is the RTMA NIC. Now, the spin programming model um, enables uh, NIC programming. In particular, it lets applications define packet handlers that run directly on the NIC. In this work, we want to uh, explore the architectural principles for in-network compute solutions like SPIN. Additionally, we also introduce uh, PSPIN, an open source in NIC accelerator implementing the SPIN programming model. So before getting into that, let's quickly review how a SPIN works. For this, we use an abstract machine model, that is uh, the contract that we basically give uh, to the programmer, so what the programmer uh, should could expect to have on the NIC. And here on the NIC, we have a fast shared memory that includes a packet input buffer, a packet scheduler, and a set of handler processing units. HPUs. The DMA unit allows us to communicate with the host memory. And at this point, the CPU uh, is not involved anymore in the critical part, but uh, uploads the handlers, so the code that uh, the applications want to uh, execute on the incoming packets, and manages the NIC memory, uh, for example, to initialize the state of the handlers. We will get back to this later. As data arrives from the network, it gets uh, written to the packet input buffer, and then the packet scheduler assigns uh, the packets to the different HPUs where the handlers are executed. At this point, the handlers can either consume the data or, for example, write it uh, back to, uh, to, to host memory. The programming model defines three types of packets given a message or a flow, the header packet, a set of payload packets, and a final completion or tail packet. The packet scheduler will trigger different um, handlers according with the packet type. So the header packet will be processed by the head handlers, uh, the payload packets will be processed by the payload handlers, and finally the, the last packet will be processed by the completion handler. So those are functions uh, that the application specifies, right? So these are user-defined functions. 
So just to see a spin in action, here we have a ping pong communication pattern where we have the initiator, the CPU memory and NIC and similar similar on the target side. So the initiator wants to send some, some packets and uh, then wants um, them back. Basically the target has to send them back. So with RTMA, they need to reach the, the NIC of the target then need to reach the host memory. And finally the CPU can realize that uh, there is a message that needs to be replied and send the packets back. In this case, our message is composed by, for example, three packets. Now, if we have spin, we could just install uh, handlers on the target NIC in a way such that we can react on a per packet basis and and uh, closer to the network. So we don't only save uh, the latency of uh, going to the PCIe and the memory hierarchy, but also improve the throughput because now we operate on a streaming fashion. So now let's get to the architectural principles. Well, the first thing is uh, that we want low latency and full throughput. Well, full throughput by full throughput, we mean uh, the, the, the network bandwidth. So we want to, to keep line frame, basically. So uh, to achieve that, uh, we need a highly parallel accelerator. So the, the accelerator implementing spin should be highly parallel. And uh, this is because parallelism is the key to throughput. In this plot, we, we have the number of HPUs that we need to keep line rate as function of the handler duration, so how long your handler lasts. For example, if we have uh, one microsecond handlers and our line rate is 200 gigabit per second, we are going to need 25 HPUs uh, to keep this, uh, this line rate. Otherwise, if we double the, the, the line rate, we also need to double the number of needed HPUs. The second requirement is fast scaling because this directly impacts on the low latency and we said that we want low latency. And finally, fast explicit memory access because we want to uh, have a high number of instructions per cycle in order to efficiently use uh, the cycle budget that we have. The second class of requirements is about supporting a wide range of use cases. This is mainly because SPIN um, is different from other network compute solutions in, in the sense that it really allows applications to define their own uh, packet handlers. So now this opens the, the opens many scenarios ranging from network accelerator data types uh, to, um, to consensus protocols to serverless computer uh, compute uh, erasure coding, packet classification, and pattern matching are just few examples. Now, many of those use of these use cases uh, actually need some state. They need some state to persist between the different uh, processing of the packets. As a consequence, we need to support stateful computations. Plus, we also want some form of handler handlers isolation in the sense that we don't want uh, handlers of application A access the memory of handlers of application B, for example. The last class of requirements is about ease of integration. So what we are essentially proposing here is to move from a model uh, that looks like this, where we have, uh, the, this is a NIC model, and the data comes from the network interface, is handled by the inbound engine, and then written to the host memory through the host interface. And we are proposing to now have a processing unit directly on the, um, on the NIC. Right. So the inbound that sits between the inbound engine and the host interface. So this means that uh, this integration has to be possible, has to be feasible. And in order to facilitate that, this uh, accelerator should be area and power efficient, plus should be configurable in the sense that it could be integrated in different scenarios, for example, to, uh, to handle heavier or lighter workloads. So you may want more or less cores on this accelerator, HPUs, um, or uh, to sustain different network bandwidths. So what we propose uh, in this work is a spin about powered implementation of the spin programming model that is designed following the principle the principles we we just discussed. So here is uh, there is again the the NIC model we discussed and we define this uh, this accelerator here the spin unit. So in, in on the accelerator we have um, we have a set of uh, all NIC memories in particular a packet buffer where we store the incoming packets a program memory where we store uh, the code of the handlers and handler memory where we store the state of the handlers. Then 
we have another unit that does uh, the scheduling and in particular decides uh, on which cluster a packet should be processed. So inside each cluster, then we have a set of HPUs here indicated with H, a fast access um, scratch map memory. Uh, this is about one megabyte and single cycle access. Um, a DMA engine that is used to move memory from this slower but bigger L2 memories to the uh, on cluster memories and a cluster scheduler. We will see in a second how the cluster scheduler and the packet scheduler interact. Uh, all the memories here are uh, scratch pods and there are no hardware caches ex except for the instruction cache that is per cluster. On the same accelerator, we also have a DMA engine that is used to move data between uh, the host memory here and the ONIC memories, a command unit that is used to let the handlers interface the um, the, uh, the NIC command unit, for example, for sending new packets out, and a monitoring and control unit. But now let's take a look uh, at how an application should interface with Bing. Well, the first thing to do is uh, to define and offload handlers. You can imagine of having a library of, um, of handlers, uh, like in this case, we have handlers for telemetry and filtering. And then for each use case, we define the three handlers, the header, the payload, and the tail handlers. And we offload them through the Spin API uh, to the L2 program memory. So at this point, we have some handlers on the link. The second step is to define an execution context. This really links like this, a specific set of handlers to a use case, in this case, packet filtering. So we, again, here we have again, the, the pointers now to the, to the handlers. We have a pointer to the NIC memory where we store the state of the handler. You can think to this as, for example, the, the rules according to which uh, packets have to be filtered and a pointer to the, um, to the host memory. <clears throat> where we, for example, keep the, um, have a buffer that the handlers can target. You can imagine to this as um, where the handlers can store the filtered packets. The last thing to do at this point is to define a matching rule. So something that tells us which packets have to be processed according to which execution context. And this is something that is done in the inbound engine. We will have some more details about this later. So once we have this, uh, we are basically ready to receive packets now from the network. So we assume from the network perspective now that there are some execution contexts installed on the, on the NIC. And the, the first thing to do is to apply this matching group. So as we receive packets, the inbound engine should uh, match them to a given execution context. If there is a match, then the packet should be processed on the PSPN unit. So this is basically what we expect uh, as input on, at the PSPN unit, so a packet and an execution context. At this point, the packet is written to the L2 packet buffer and made, and made accessible within the accelerator. The third step is then to select a cluster where the, the packet should be processed. At this point, the packet is still here. And so the next step is to copy it to the fast uh, access memory. In a way such that then the handler that will run on a selected HPU can, can access it uh, with, with single cycle accesses. Overall, to schedule packets, so uh, from when we see from when we see the packets at the PSPN unit to when we uh, we start executing the, the related handler, um, the the, the PSPN unit takes tens of nanoseconds, and this also depends on the packet size because of this data move. So now the question is, how do we get to 400 G? So in this, uh, in this picture, we again have the components of the accelerator. So we have the memories here, the clusters with the L1 memories and the MA engines, and then the external interfaces, like the, the, the interface that the host uses to access the, the NIC memories, the NIC inbound. So here, from here, the data comes, NIC outbound, that is used to read data when uh, we want to send new data out of the network and DMA that is used to uh, move data between the host memory and the ONIC memories. So uh, we have three main interconnects. We don't have the time to go into the details. However, I just want to point out that there are three main flows to take care of. In particular, the inbound flow that uh, comes from the NIC inbound, so that pushes data to the packet memory. And then this same data is pulled by these DMA engines into the L1 memories of the different clusters. So here we want to make sure that we actually get to 400G. And to fix this bottleneck, we use a banked memory, full duplex dual port. 
And then the second uh, flow, second and third flow to take care of is uh, are the ones that actually bring data out of the accelerator, in particular to the network or to the host memory. So here you can imagine that uh, the handlers are issuing commands either to send new packets or to DMA the data to the, uh, to the host memory. And even in this case, we want to support full bandwidth. So to recap, so and, and here the, the memory that is targeted could be either L1 or or the L2 memories. So to recap, what we uh, we want to offer basically is um, for, is full bandwidth on the inbound side. So to let the NIC push uh, packets to the to, to the L2 memory and uh, full bandwidth on the outbound side. So to the system composed by the NIC outbound and the DMA engine. So we synthesized uh, the accelerator in global foundries 22 nanometer FT soy, uh, and we were able to close the timing at one gigahertz. The post synthesis analysis uh, gives us uh, 95 megagate equivalent as area. This corresponds to uh, 18.5 micrometers squared in this technology. And the power envelope is about 6.1 watts, for which th this is a really worst case. In fact, 98% of this is dynamic power. So in the paper, you, you find a uh, uh, detailed breakdown of all the components of spin in terms of area and power. So the thing to notice is that most of the area and power is taken by uh, the memories. Here we have uh, the relative area, for example, and you can see that here are the clusters and here, here is L2 that takes more than 60% of the, of the total area. And if we look inside a cluster, then we have a similar situation where more than 80% is taken by the L1 memory. So for comparison, if we look at Mellanox Bluefield with 16 A72 cores, we can estimate the area of this accelerator, so just the core complex, uh, as uh, 51 micrometers squared. So we are at about at half, uh, less than half of that. So the last bit I want to touch uh, is about the NIC integration. So how the inbound engine should look like, and in particular, how the matching should be done. Well, the ideal thing is to have match action tables. So this is something like uh, P4, and we get to uh, parse the packets, to, 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 to parse the packets, and then to apply match action rules that could be defined again by the application. Now, for example, here we have a match action rule that says whenever you see a quick, uh, a quick flow with flow ID this one, well, then I want to process this with this execution context that, for example, implements or, or handles the, the quick protocol. If we have a match like this that, that associates the, the flow with an execution context, then we send the packet for further processing to the PSPN unit. Otherwise, we send it normally to the host interface. On the, uh, if we have RDMA NICs, for example, uh, this could be even simpler because RDMA NICs already do some, some form of packet matching in order to associate packets to queue pairs that are instantiated already by applications. So now we could add uh, other uh, additionally to the standard queue pairs, some processing queue pairs, uh, for which uh, if a packet gets matched to those, then it means that it needs further processing on the PSP unit. So we could associate basically the execution context to the queue pairs. Okay, so to recap uh, a bit the principles we discussed, so low latency, uh, we see that this pin basically uh, marks all of them. In fact, is highly parallel and configurable, so you can add more cores or more clusters. Um, it provides fast scheduling. We are in tens of nanoseconds and fast explicit memory access via the L1 memory. It supports a wide range of use cases. In fact, the, the stateful computation support is implicit in the spin programming model. Plus, we provide handler isolation. We didn't discuss this here, but this is achieved through the risk 5 PNP unit. Also, it's easy to integrate. In fact, is area and power efficient, plus is configurable. So now let's get to some experimental results. So for this, we uh, simulate a, with SQL accurate simulations the proposed accelerator, while the rest of the NIC model is simulated with behavioral models. So the first thing we want to explore is about the different use cases that um, that we can face on uh, on a PSPN unit. So we we select use cases ranging from simple packet stealing to data movement to full packet processing, where we really have to go uh, through uh, all the bytes of the of the packet. So what we uh, what we get here, we plot the, the throughput in gigabit per second for the different use cases. And then for each use case, we have different packet sizes. 
64 bytes, 512 bytes, and 1K. So what we notice is that for medium-sized packets, so 512, we are um, in, in many cases able to reach 400 gigabit and more. So basically here we don't cap the, um, the, incoming, bet, the incoming bandwidth. So our maximum is uh, the interconnection bandwidth, which is 512 gigabit per second. We suffer a bit with small packets, and this is mainly because of the limited time budget we have. So with 32 cores here, we plot the maximum handler time. So after this time, the handler handlers basically become a bottleneck as function of the packet size for different time rates. And you can see how you have just uh, like 50 cycles in order to process a 64 bytes packet. packet. So the second question we want to, uh, to answer is uh, now why risk five? Why um, uh, so simple architecture and what would happen if we would have more complex architectures. So for this, we run the same handlers on uh, on Axion Gold running at three gigahertz. This is four-way superscalar out of order 64 bits on an ARM-based uh, uh, machine with the Cortex A53 cores at 1.2 gigahertz, two-way superscalar 64 bits. And these are compared against Bispin, which uh, we, that have very simple cores, so single issue, uh, RISC-V, uh, 32 bits in order running at one gigahertz. So what we see is that now we plot, um, again, the gigabit per second for the different use cases. But now we have here the Xeon Gold, here the ARM, and here this pin. So what we see is that for compute intensive tasks like filtering, which is basically doing an hash function, well, then the, the powerful, more powerful machine, the more powerful architectures uh, show, show off, right? So, on the other side, it's surprising also to see that already for key value store, for example, actually PSPIN is actually is, is able to compete with more powerful uh, architectures. So once again, this is the per core throughput, not the total throughput. So the problem is that this comparison is not totally fair. In fact, these machines ha are really different in, term in terms of uh, occupied a area and power. So now if we normalize uh, the area of these machines, in particular the area per processing elements to the same technology and to the same amount of resources, for example, the memory that, uh, that is available, then and we plot then the throughput um, scaled to, to the normalized area. Well, th this is then a form of uh, efficiency. So we have gigabit per second per uh, micrometer squared. And we see that this being basically outperforms the, the other architectures in all the cases. In the paper, we have uh, many more uh, details and insights about this analysis. So we invite you to, uh, to check it out. Okay, so to conclude, um, we highlight the importance of packet processing and show how SPIN provides a solution for uh, liberating NIC programming. We define architectural principles for uh, designing a, a, a unit implementing the SPIN programming model, and we think that they, they can be generalized to uh, any other in-network compute solution that does packet processing. And we introduce PSPIN, an open source part powered implementation of SPIN and uh, show how it satisfies and how it respects all the principles we introduced and evaluate uh, its performance under different use cases. So this pin is available on, on GitHub. There you will find the RTL, the runtime, and several examples. Contribution are, are welcome. So this concludes my talk. Thank, thank you for listening. And uh, if you have any questions, then uh, please get, get back to us.